Hello, and thank you for tuning in today. You guys may have watched the Swiss Family Robinson that Disney put out. That is a, a, a wonderful show. I recommend you guys go watch it. It is really, really good. It has a lot of differences than the original book, but that's kind of... That's how things are in order for you to put it down into a condensed style that will last less than two hours when you've got like a, what? The 200 plus page book. But The Swiss Family Robinson is a wonderful book of um, strength, of learning, of sticking together as a family, of working of persevering would be another good word. Anyway, let's go ahead here and we are going to start on the first chapter, Shipwrecked and Alone. <clears throat> For many days, we had been tempest-tossed. Six times had the darkness closed over a wild and terrific scene, and returning light as often brought, but renewed distress for the raging storm increased in fury until, on the seventh day, all hope was lost. We were driven completely out of our course. No conjecture could be formed as to our whereabouts. The crew had lost heart and were utterly exhausted by incessant labor. The riven masts had gone by the board. Leaks had been sprung in every direction, and the water which rushed in gained upon us rapidly. Instead of reckless oaths, the seamen now uttered frantic cries to God for mercy, mingled with strange and often ludicrous vows to be performed should deliverance be granted. Every man on board alternately condemned his soul to his creator and strove to bethink himself of some means of saving his life. My heart sank as I looked round upon my family in the midst of the horrors. Our four young sons were overpowered by terror. Dear children, said I, if the Lord will, he can save us even from this fearful peril. peril. If not, let us calmly yield our lives into his hand and think of the joy and blessedness of finding ourselves forever and ever united in that happy home above. At these words, my weeping wife looked bravely up and, as the boys clustered round her, she began to cheer and encourage them with calm and loving words. I rejoiced to see her fortitude, though my heart was readily to break as I gazed on my dear ones. We knelt down together, one after another, praying with deep earnest and emotion. Fritz, in particular, besought help and deliverance for his dear parents and brothers, as though quite forgetting himself. Our hearts were soothed by the never-failing comfort of childlike, confiding prayer, and the horror of the situation seemed less overwhelming. Ah, thought I, the Lord will hear our prayer. He will help us. Amid the roar of the thundering waves, I suddenly heard a loud cry of, Land! Land! while at the same instant the ship struck with a frightful shock which threw everyone to the deck and seemed to threaten her immediate destruction. Dreadful sounds betoken the breaking up of the ship and the roaring waters poured in on all sides. Then the voice of the captain was heard above the tumult, shouting, Lower away the boats. We are lost. Lost? I exclaimed. And the world went like a dagger to my heart. 
but seen my children terror renewed. I composed myself, calling out cheerfully, Take courage, my boys. We are all above water, yet th there is the land not far off. Let us do our best to reach it. You know God helps those that help themselves. With that, I left them and went on deck. What was my horror when through the foam and spray I beheld the only remaining boat leave the ship, the last of the seamen spring into her and push off. Regardless of my cries and entreaties that we might be allowed to share their slender chance of persevering their lives. My voice was drowned into the howling of the blast, and even had the crew wished it, the return of the boat was impossible. Casting my eyes despairingly around, I became gradually aware that our position was by no means hopeless. Inasmuch as the stern of the ship containing our cabin was jammed between two high rocks, and was partly raised from among the breakers, which dashed the forepart to pieces. As the clouds of mist and rain drove past, I could make out, through rents in the vaporous curtain, a line of rocky coast, and rugged as it was, my heart bounded toward it as a sign of help in the hour of need. Yet the sense of our lonely and forsaken condition weighed heavily upon me as I returned to my family, constraining myself to say with a smile, Courage, dear ones, although our good ship will never sail more, she is so placed that our cabin will remain above water, and tomorrow, if the wind and waves abate, I see no reason why we should not be able to get ashore. These three, these few words had an immediate effect on the spirits of my children, who at once regarded our problematic chance of escaping as a happy certainty, and began to enjoy the relief from the violent pitching and rolling of the vessel. My wife, however, perceived my distress and anxiety in spite of my forced composure, and I made her comprehend our real situation greatly fearing the effect of the intelligence on her nerves. Not for a moment did her courage and trust in providence forsake her, and on seeing this my fortitude revived. We must find some food and take a good supper, said she. It will never do to grow faint by fasting too long. We shall require our utmost strength tomorrow. Night drew on apace. The storm was as fierce as ever, and at intervals we were startled by crashes announcing further damage to our unfortunate ship. God will help us soon now, won't he, father? said my youngest child. You silly little thing, said Fritz, my eldest son, sharply. Don't you know that we must not settle what God is to do for us, we must have patience and wait his time. Very well, said. Had it been said kindly, Fritz, my boy, you too often speak harshly to your brothers, although you may not mean to do so. A good meal being now ready, my youngsters ate heartily and retiring to rest were speedily fast asleep. Fritz, who was in age to be aware of the real danger we were in, kept watch with us. After a long silence, Father, said he, don't you think we might contrive swimming belts for mother and the boys? With those, we might all escape for land, for you and I can swim. Your idea is so good answered I, that I shall arrange something at once in case of an accident during the night. We immediately searched about for what would answer the purpose, and fortunately got a hold of a number of empty casks and tin canisters, which we connected two and two together 
so as to form floats sufficiently buoyant to support a person in the water, and my wife and young sons each willingly put one on. I then provided myself with matches, knives, cord, and other portable articles, trusting that should the vessel go to pieces before daylight, we might gain the shore not wholly destitute. Fritz, as well as his brothers, now slept soundly. Throughout the night, my wife and I maintained our prayerful watch, dreading at the very fresh sound some fatal change in the position of the wreck. At length, the faint dawn of day appeared. The long, weary night was over, and with thankful hearts we perceived that the gale had begun to moderate. Blue sky was seen above us, and the lovely hues of sunrise adorned the eastern horizon. I aroused my boys, and we assembled on the remaining portion of the deck, when they, to their surprise, discovered that no one else was on board. Hello, Papa. What has become of everybody? Are the sailors gone? Have they taken away with the boats? Oh, Papa, why did they leave us behind? What can we do by ourselves? My good children, I replied, we must not despair, although we seem deserted. See how those on whose skill and good faith we depended have left us as cruelly to our fate in the hour of danger. God will never do so. He has not forsaken us, and we will trust him still. Only let us bestir ourselves, and each cheerily do his best. Who has anything to propose? The sea will soon be calm enough for swimming, said Fritz. And that would be all very fine for you, exclaimed Ernest. But think of mother and the rest of us. Why not build a raft and all get on shore? together. We should find it difficult, I think, to make a raft that would carry us safe to shore. However, we must contrive something, and first let each try to procure what will be of the most use to us. Away we all went to see what was to be found, I myself proceeding to examine as of great consequence the supplies of provisions and fresh water within our reach. My wife took her youngest son, Franz, to help her to feed the unfortunate animals on board, who were in a pitiful plight, having been neglected now for several days. Fritz hastened to the arms chest. Ernest to look for tools, and Jack went toward the captain's cabin, the door of which he no sooner opened than out sprang two splendid large dogs who had ter uh, testified their extreme delight and gratitude by such tremendous bounds that they knocked their little deliverer completely head over heels, frightening him nearly out of his wits. Jack did not long yield to either fear or anger. He presently recovered himself. The dogs seemed to ask pardon by vehemently licking his face and hands. And so, seizing the larger by the ears, he jumped on his back and, to my great amusement, coolly rode to meet me as I came up the hatchway. When we reassembled in the cabin, we all displayed our treasures. Fritz brought a couple of guns, shot belt, powder flasks, and plenty of bullets. Ernest produced a cap of full nails, an ask, axe and a hammer, while pincers, chisels, and augers stuck out of all his pockets. Little Franz carried a box and eagerly began to show us nice, sharp little hooks. It contained, Well done, Franz, cried I. These fish hooks, which you, the youngest, have found, may contribute more than anything else in the ship to save our lives by procuring food for us. Fritz and Ernst, you have chosen well. Will you praise me too? said my dear wife. I have nothing to show. 
but I can give you good news. Some useful animals are still alive. A cow, a donkey, two goats, six sheep, a ram, and a fine sow. I was but just in time to save their lives by taking food to them. All these things are excellent indeed, said I. But my friend Jack here has presented me with a couple of huge, hungry, useless dogs who will eat more than any of us. Oh, Papa, they will be of use. Why, they will help us to hunt when we get ashore. No doubt they will, if ever we do get on shore, Jack. But I must say I don't know how it is to be done. Can't we each get into a big tub and float there? returned he. I have often sailed splendidly like that round a pond at home. My child, you have hit on a capital idea, cried I. Now, Ernest, let me have your tools, hammers, nails, saws, augers, and axe, and then make haste to collect any tubs you can find. We very soon found four large casks made of sound wood and strongly bound with iron hoops. They were floating with many other things in the water in the hold, but we managed to fish them out and drag them to suitable place for launching. There we were exactly what I wanted, and I succeeded in sawing them across the middle. Hard work it was, and we were glad enough to stop and refresh ourselves with wine and biscuits. My eight tubs now stood ranged in a row near the water's edge, and I looked at them with great satisfaction. To my surprise, my wife did not seem to share my pleasure. I shall never, she said, muster courage to get into one of those. Do not be so sure of that, dear wife. When you see my contrivance completed, you will perhaps prefer it to this immovable wreck. I next procured a long, thin plank on which my tubs could be fixed, and the two ends of this I bent upward so as to form a kneel. Other two planks were nailed along the side of the tubs. They also, be being flexible, were brought to a point at each end and all firmly secured and nailed together. I felt satisfied that in smooth water this craft would be perfectly trustworthy, but when we thought all was ready for the launch, we found, to our dismay, that the grand contrivance was so heavy and clumsy that even our united efforts could not move it an inch. I must have a lever, cried I. Run and fetch the capstan bar. Fritz quickly brought one, and having formed rollers by cutting up a long spar, I raised the forepart of the boat with the bar, and my sons placed the roller under it. How is that, father? inquired Ernst. That with that thing you alone can do more than all of us together. How is that, father? I explained as well as I could in a hurry the principle of the lever, and promised to have a long talk on the subject of mechanics should we have future opportunity. I now made fast a long rope to the stern of our boat, attaching the other end of the beam, then placing the second and third roller under it. We once more began to push, this time, with success, and soon our gallant craft was safely launched. So swiftly, indeed, did she guide into the water that, but for the rope, she would have passed beyond our reach. The boys wished to jump in directly, but alas, she leaned so much on one side that they could not venture to do so. Some heavy things being thrown in, however, the boat righted itself by degrees, and the boys were so delighted that they struggled which should first leap in to have the fun of sitting down in the tubs. But it was plain to me at once that something more was required to make her perfectly safe. So I contrived outriggers 
to preserve the balance by nailing long poles across it at the stern and stem, and fixing at the end of each empty brandy casks. Then, the boat appearing steady, I got in, and turning it toward the most open side of the wreck, I cut and cleared away obstructions so as to leave a free passage for our departure. All the boys brought oars to be ready for the voyage. This important undertaking we were forced to postpone until the next day, as it was by this time far too late to attempt it. It was not pleasant to have spent another night in so precarious a situation, but yielding to necessity, we sat down to enjoy the comfortable supper. For during our exciting and incessant work all day, we had taken nothing but an occasional biscuit and a little wine. We prepared for rest in a much happier frame of mind than the preceding day. And I did not forget the possibility of a renewed storm, and therefore made everyone put on the belt as before, then retiring to our hearths, peaceful sleep prepared us for all the exertions of the coming day. So this ship is traveling to the new world to start a colony and they ended up being stuck in a storm for a long time and getting off course and apparently getting stuck on the rocks or reefs or objects that are actually near the shore that kind of stick up out of the water and so when they ran ground or ran up onto the rocks and became stuck everyone bailed leaving the Swiss family Robinson behind and they have to make their own way this is a wonderful story and as you see it'll kind of grow and you'll see how they survive what they do to survive and how they stick together thank you guys so much for tuning in today and you guys have a wonderful and blessed day.